What did you do now? Oh, well, my sister and I were out and about earlier today, and, well, I happened to stumble across this thing. And it is... Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Found this little beauty. Let me check this action out. Where did you get that thing? And more importantly, why? Well, as for where, my sister and I were hanging out downtown, and I found this guy just, you know, sitting in the window of an antique shop. I was like, wow, this is a really cool puppet. And as for why, you may ask, it was a steal. The guy practically gave him to me. I can see why. He's a beat-up mess. Yeah, well, Jerry, what happened to your face? But you're bad jokes. They crack me up. <laughs> Look, there's too much junk in here as it is. Besides, you have too many ventriloquist puppets. Bring any more in here, they're gonna have to start paying rent. And who would want to live here? The water bill is outrageous. What? Do I got a bug or something? Okay... no. Nope, nope, nope. I'm done. I'm going back to bed. Rest easy, pal. Shut up! Greetings, Internet, and welcome back for another Oxlimations presentation. And we're having another Check Out My Junk video. <clears throat> now, I'm going to preface this one now. If any of my viewers have automatonophobia or a fear of mannequins, robots, ventriloquist puppets, and the like, now is the time for you to look away from the screen or click away from the video. Because for today's video, if it wasn't already obvious, I'm going to be talking about ventriloquist puppets. Shock and awe, I know. But, I, I was thinking hard on it, and I think this is going to be the, you know, this is going to be the best topic for this video. So now to preface this, I already did. Yeah, we'll just keep rolling. Anyways, I've always kind of had a fascination with puppets and stuff since I was a kid. <clears throat> and it all, I believe, began with an old videotape that one of my aunts or uncles had. Essentially, you know, the anyone my age or in my similar age group would remember how they used to have, like, videotapes that they would sell on the cheap with, like, a bunch of random public domain cartoons and clips on them. Well, my aunt happens to have one that had clips from the Howdy Doody show. Now, a lot of people from my generation probably won't know what that is. And definitely people from the current generation. But essentially, it was a marionette show starring this cowboy marionette named Howdy Doody. And it, the whole show was run by this guy named Buffalo Bob, and he would had you know, he would talk with the puppets, and they would go on zany little, I don't know how long, adventures. <clears throat> but that's not the center of this story. So, like I was saying, Howdy Doody was essentially what got me interested in puppets, and the ones with the moving mouths especially. Then stuff came along like Lamb Chops Play Along was another show I liked growing up. And those kind of shows got me really interested in the realm of puppetry. And it was a certain show in particular that got me interested in ventriloquist puppets. A lot of people from my generation will remember this. But it was a certain episode of the series Goosebumps which I happen to have a VHS copy of right here. Night of the Living Dummy 3. This right here got me really, really, really interested in like ventriloquist dummies. And it wasn't because of Slappy or anything like that. I just saw uh, Trina and Daniel's dad's collection of puppets and I was like, whoa, those are really cool. Because for those of you that remember, 
he had like a wide assortment of different puppets. You know, he had like uh, the head on the stick puppets. He had the, you know, the soft foam puppets. He had a whole gallery, a gallery of them. And I was like, just for the longest time, I was fascinated and I was obsessed. I wanted to get ventriloquist dummies. And for the longest time, I couldn't get one because again, I come from a poor family and they couldn't afford the 50 bucks to send away to this magazine that, well, hold on, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, <clears throat> so for years and years I wanted one of these, but I could never get one, didn't know where to get one, my parents didn't know where to get one, and then randomly one day in the mail, we happened to get this catalog from a company called Throw Things, and this catalog was really cool. The one I got in particular was a Halloween issue. I can still remember the cover clear as day. It was like a graveyard setup. They had like this prop skeleton standing there. It was wearing like this uh, red and black striped shoot, uh, suit top with uh, black pants and undershirt. He was holding his head in his hand like this. And it was one of those really cheap ones where like you could tell there was just a wire armature underneath the cloth. And at the top of it, I'd throw things kind of in that creep show font, if you all know what I'm talking about. And this thing was just awesome. It was the first time I'd ever seen a magazine like that. Turns out it was a catalog, not actually a magazine, but I didn't care. I loved the art on the cover. I loved the way they arranged it. And that was the only one I ever got for years. But anyway, I had this, mag uh, this catalog. And I'd flip through it, looking at all the cool stuff in it. And then towards the back of the catalog, they had listed ventriloquist puppets. And I was just, like, enamored by this. I was like, so this is where you get those. This is where everyone gets them, from Throw Things Magazine. Not realizing that, you know, there were actual, like, large companies and places all over the world where you could get these things. To my young kid self, this was like the be all end all. This is where they came from. So I went to my parents and I was like, you know how I've been wanting this thing? Well, look, right here in this magazine, it's right here. It's like $49.99, you know, 50 bucks for a basic model, but I didn't understand what basic model meant. I thought that was just like, you know, head on a stick. Like the mouth moved, but like the eyes and everything else were all stationary. But my parents couldn't afford to get me one because, as I was saying previously, I come from a poor family and they couldn't afford the 50 bucks to send away for something for me. Especially for something that, let's face it, I was a little kid, I probably would have grown tired of it in like 10 minutes, thrown it off to the side and moved on to the next big thing in my life. So, for years and years I held on to this catalog always flipping back and forth through it and always like rereading the descriptions of the puppets. I think uh, the ones they had listed in the catalog were um, Charlie McCarthy, Mortimer Snurd, Danny O'Day, and I think either W.C. Fields or Groucho Marx. I can't remember for sure, it's been too long. But I held on to that catalog for years. It was just the greatest thing in my opinion at that time. And so, years go by, and I still was kind of obsessed with trying to, well, not obsessed. I still wanted to get one, but it wasn't my top priority anymore. And at one point, I actually basically just kind of completely forgot about it. Until one fateful birthday, my parents come up to me and they go, and they did this in the most cringy way possible. It was like they were announcing I had a baby brother. Yeah, uh, non uh, another sibling, like my mother was pregnant or something. They literally, you know, called me over, walked over, and they're like, now, Critter, which is my nickname that they gave me. And they, my dad actually looked at her, she looked at him, they like did the whole weird lock hand things and go, we've decided we're going to get you a dummy. And I was like, yay? Mind you, by this time I was, like, early teenage years, I 
Well, I was either tween or teen. I forget if I was 12 or 14. I was somewhere in that area. But I still liked puppets and the whole idea, but I had basically gotten beyond ventriloquist puppets. So when they're like, we're gonna get you a dummy, I was like, yay, I think. And it turns out that since they ordered it through the mail, the thing wasn't gonna show up as quickly as I was hoping, or it wasn't gonna show up in time for my birthday is what I meant to say. And so it wound up showing up like a week or two after my birthday, but it was still really cool. The only thing that sucked is it showed up right before I had to go to school that day. It's like, awesome! And now I get to put it over on the couch so I can open the box when I get home. But when I got home, I was like, awesome! I finally got a puppet, I finally got a dummy, because I was picturing, you know, like, like I already was talking about, like a head stick, you pull the trigger, the mouth goes, nah, 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 and something like that. I open up the box, and it's one of those soft-bodied ones with the plastic head and the plastic hands, but everything else is like a rag doll. And it was a Charlie McCarthy, which was okay. You know, your first dummy being a Charlie McCarthy, it's not that bad. But I saw the cloth body, I was like, this is awesome, but what do I do with it? Because <laughs> that was another thing. As a kid, I knew I wanted one, but I didn't know how they worked. I didn't know that you actually had to work them from the inside, even though I was just saying that I had all these ex expectations of what it should be. But anyway, I didn't know much about ventriloquism and all that. Uh, way, way, way back when I was a kid, I actually borrowed a book from the library about learning how to do ventriloquism. And I got a doubt as far as learning how to replace certain letters with other letters. Or letters with other letters. But that was it. I could basically say, the dig doy blew into the balloon. And it sounded just about like that all those years ago. The dig doy blew into the balloon. Instead of the big boy blew into the balloon. But in preparation, because I thought for sure when I was a kid that I was going to get a puppet. I was going to get a dummy. It was going to be awesome. And I just kept practicing and practicing. And then, like happens with little kids, my interests shifted. And I stopped practicing, which is why I'm not good at it, even to this day. So, I jumped back to where I was in the story. I got this Charlie McCarthy and I was like, wow, this is really cool, but what do I do with it? Then I found the little brochure in the back of it, you know, the, uh, the seven simple trips for ventriloquism. I was looking at it, and it basically was saying the same basic info that was in that book that I got when I was a kid. And I was like, okay, this is useless. <laughs> so I just tossed it aside, and I just had a ventriloquist puppet. One of the soft-bodied cloth ones. But still, it was better than not having a puppet. <clears throat> so... As time progressed, I wound up actually starting to develop a bit of a collection of these things. It started off with Charlie McCarthy, and then somewhere along the lines, my uncle, who owns a junk shop, wound up finding a couple of these. He wound up getting a, uh, another Charlie McCarthy, a much, much older one, that had a more firm, stiff body to him. He wasn't the hard-bodied uh, hard one with the head on a stick. He was another, you know, pull string puppet. But this one, because it was made earlier, was made better. You know, like I was saying, a nice stiff body, he'd actually sit up and you could, like, put your hand on the back, grab, like, the string, like, here and, like, pull it out of the back of his head just so and make it a little more convincing. Whereas the Charlie McCarthy I had was literally understuffed and he was like a pillow. If you tried to sit him up, he would just go like this. Or, let's be real, if I sat him up, like, on a edge of a table or something, he would just crumble and fall off the table. Crumple, not crumble. He would crumple and fall off the table. So getting this other Charlie McCarthy was really cool. And then from there, I got, like, different ones. I uh, had an Emmett Kelly at one point. I uh, had a, a Mickey Mouse ventriloquist puppet. Believe it or not, that was actually a thing. And he was a hard-bodied plastic one. I had, I had one called Simon Says, Willie Talk. I had a whole bunch of them. And, well, 
to finally shift focus to where this video is supposed to focus on a certain collection from my collection of ventriloquist puppets. Today I'm going to be talking to you about my Jerry Mahoney collection. Now with Jerry Mahoney he was a puppet that, uh, sorry, he was a ventriloquist figure used by a man by the name of Paul Winchell. And Paul Winchell had a, a, a series of characters back in his day, back in the 50s and 60s, right around the time Charlie McCarthy and Edgar Bergen were, you know, starting to lose their popularity. He was starting to be, uh, become popular around that time. <clears throat> and they had their own show, the uh, Winchell Mahoney program, or the Winchell Mahoney show, I believe it was called. And that's where these characters became the most popular, was on the Winchell Mahoney show. And there were several different variations of these puppets they released in that time. Initially, the original puppets, because it was cheaper to make them this way, were made out of composition and cloth, and were like that pull string mechanism. I've actually got one right here. You just, basically, you guys saw him at the beginning of the video in that little skit I put together. By the way, let me know in the comments what you thought of that. But anyway, when they initially made these, or uh, started making puppets for Paul Winchell, or uh, not Paul Winchell, for Jerry Mahoney, they were like this. Like a hard, almost wooden head. It's like painted and with a string coming out of the back of the neck, like this. And when you pull the string, obviously, bah, 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 their mouth opens. But one of the downsides of these puppets is that they're not very durable. Well, I can't say that, because, I mean, this is one of the... I believe this is one of the earliest examples. I mean, this particular model is one of the earliest examples. But originally, he had a composition head like this had composition hands, which would explain why this one's missing his hands, because they got shattered at some point. And then a full cloth ragdoll body, it's all limp and stuff. But then, they moved on from composition, like him, to using plastics at one point during the 1960s. Now, unfortunately at this point, I don't actually have a plastic Jerry Mahoney like this. But, I do have the very hard to find Knucklehead Smith. And Knucklehead Smith was another character from the Winchell Mahoney show. Uh, basically, he was Jerry's friend from school. And fun fact, to anyone who's a Disney fan, Tigger from Winnie the Pooh, he was voiced by Paul Winchell. And it's basically the same voice as Knucklehead Smith. Or, sorry, Knucklehead Smith because it's S-M-I-F-F. -F. But anyway, as I was stating, after a time, they moved on from composition to plastic, like Knucklehead here. You know, plastic head, plastic hands, although I believe they were still using the same mold from the composition hands, because I had a a composition Jerry Mahoney like that before that still had his hands, and they were very similar to these. They yeah, still the, uh, basically the same basic style, soft rag doll body. And of course, the string in the back of the head to make the mouth go whack, 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 whack. And to anyone with automatonophobia who's still with me at this point, I'm sorry about that. But if, if you see right here on the tag on his shirt, Paul Winchell's Knucklehead Smith, you can kind of make out the uh, stitch version of Paul Winchell's face right there next to Knucklehead. Yeah, they moved from composition to plastic like this. And also, they offered a second model of Jerry. They didn't just have these cloth body ones. They also had... Give me just a second. They also had these guys with a head on a stick. 
so you could turn it around and stuff like that and whatnot. And <clears throat> if you so chose, you could even just take the head out of the body entirely. But why anyone would want to do that other than for comedic effect, I don't know. But it's the same basic principle for man uh, manipulating the mouth on these. Because there's, as you can see, there is a string that comes out of the base of the neck there. And when you pull on it, the mouth opens. See? It's hard to demonstrate and hold the head at the same time with it being outside the body. But anyway, so they had the initial version like this, which has a hard plastic head made of that unbreakable plastic they had back in the day. The big difference is they had composition hands, which were a lot thicker and clunkier and clackier and stuff. Also, initially, they had like actual, I think these are actual leather or faux leather shoes or patent leather, whatever that's called, with cardboard uh, bases on them, cardboard heels, I guess you could call it. And with Knucklehead down, or as with Knucklehead's outfit down there, they were all supposed to have their name, or the uh, Paul Winchell sticker, like right here above the pocket. Unfortunately, Knucklehead's the only one of my puppets, of my Jerry Mahoney collection that still has his. But, yeah. And they also later came out with the Jerry Mahoney that I'm about to bring up next. Now, unfortunately, this Jerry is incomplete, but given what I paid for him, I'm happy with it. Because I'll, I'll level with you guys. These things are not cheap. The cheapest one I have is this really beat up composition Jerry over here, but well, that's just because he was in such terrible condition when I found him. <clears throat> but anyway, the other large size Jerry Mahoney that I have here is the second of three different versions of this model of Jerry. Now this guy, well, I should say this real quick. This first Jerry here, this guy was produced during the 1950s, and like I said, at that point in time it was cheaper to use composition, I think. Don't quote me on that, but I believe it was cheaper to use composition because it was more durable, and that's literally just like wax and sawdust to make that. But then they switched over to using plastic instead of composition, like I already said with the heads. And the way you can tell this is a second generation Jerry is because, well, his head is in far, or was made far uh, more cheaply, I'll put it that way. Like, here, allow me to demonstrate. Okay, <clears throat> now comparing them side by side, here's the original 1950s Jerry. See how the paint is on him? You know, it's pretty close to the actual character if you were to go and do a Google search right now. And notice how the seam on the side of his head is actually pretty smooth on both sides like that. Now also take note of the shape of his head. That's pretty squared and all that. Now take a look at 1960s Jerry. See his paint's a lot more different, or a lot different. Like, one thing you'll notice right off the bat, his eyebrows are a lot smaller. And another thing I forgot to mention is the gap around the mouth. Like, bringing up 50s Jerry again. See how small the gap is there? With 1960s Jerry, they widened it out a lot. So like when you're pulling the string his mouth just kind of rattles back and forth a bit. And they also started like just not doing a very good job of cutting the gap around the mouth. Like see how it's got like a Nike curve right here? It starts here and then dips up. 
And like I was saying about the seam, if you look really closely on the side of this Jerry right there, his head is, over the years, has actually begun to split along the seam. Thankfully, it's only on the one side so far. But that's just not good. Also, if you notice, his temples are a lot more squished a lot more compressed than they are on the 50s Jerry. It's hard to get them both in frame, but you can just really tell the difference in quality. In the 60s, they just really dropped the ball hard. Oh, that's another difference right there, I just realized. If you look at the hooks, or the little loops, it's a nice thin piece of plastic on 50s Jerry, and it's like a, a more rounded piece of plastic on 60s Jerry here. <clears throat> now, as I was saying before, there are three different models of this particular Jerry Mahoney. There are these two, the one with the composition hands, the one with plastic hands, and I believe they still use this same mold for like the more modern ventriloquist figures, like the new Charlie McCarthy's and all those figures. And then of course, oh, uh, also something that should be rather obvious to you guys is the outfits are different. Like uh, that one over there, he's got more of a gray and green going on and this is just multi multiple colors, shades of green. But anyway, the third version of Jerry Mahoney, which I do not own one, or own yet, because it's really expensive when you find one, is a Moving Eyes Jerry Mahoney. It's basically the same principle as this, only you would have a second string coming off the side, and when you'd pull on said string, his eyes would go from looking straight forward to shifting over to one side, and then back to normal. Now, another thing that I think is pretty cool about these things is the fact that they put so much attention to detail in them. Give me just a second. Like, for one thing, when it came to the, uh, the big Jerry's like over here, they released him in a cardboard suitcase that you could take around with you. Unfortunately, I don't have one of the original boxes. However, someone actually cut up one, and with that, uh, with this Jerry here, they wound up selling just this one section of it to go along with him. And on this, it's got a picture of uh, Paul Winchell over here. A higher quality image than the one on the labels and then of course for whatever reason they decided to use a, 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 a there we go use a picture of the soft body Jerry puppet <clears throat> to go on the advertising on that you know with the suitcase it was double-sided so this was printed on this side and then it was also printed on this side and then, you know, it was basically a cardboard box shaped, shaped like a suitcase. And with the smaller Jerry's, they came in like a, a little shipping box. Unfortunately, I don't have his. I do, however, have knuckleheads. But it's in pretty bad shape. Okay, see? Paul Winchell's famous knucklehead, manufactured by Gerald Novelty Company, New York 3, New York. It was like that, printed on both sides of the box. Then they would put the shipping label on top of the box, and here's what's left of the shipping label from this one. And 
these puppets all came with. Uh, just a moment. All came up. Uh, came with a how to be a ventriloquist pamphlet. I got really lucky in that this knucklehead Smith that I got actually still had his with him. So they all came with one of these little booklets right here. Honestly, I should be uh, what's the word? using gloves while touching this because the skin or the oils from my skin are not good for this. But yeah. Like it's, it actually shows right here on the back. The uh, Juro, a compliments of Juro Novelty Company, 18, uh, 18 East 18th Street, New York, 3 New York. Exclusive manufacturers of Juro celebrity dolls, including Paul Winchell's Jerry Mahoney ventriloquist doll, and professional dummy with moving eyes. Just so y'all can see that there. Um, knuckleheads, the knucklehead ventriloquist doll. Three Stooges novelty dolls, Dick Clark autograph and dancing dolls, etc., etc. And something interesting about these is they actually came with a biography of Paul Winchell and a history of ventriloquism by Paul Winchell and assisted by Jerry Mahoney. And this is what Jerry looked like on TV back in those days. But yeah, <clears throat> I am getting back to what inspired me to collect these things. When I had first been introduced to the concept of ventriloquist puppets and stuff through that episode of Goosebumps, I was in really fascinated by all the mo mechanics and moving parts, like Slappy's eyes and his eyebrows and all that happy, good nonsense and stuff. And I would hop onto eBay, because I was the kind of teenager who did this kind of stuff. And I would hop on there, and I would just look at, like, ventriloquist puppets and stuff. And I would see how much they were and how expensive they were. And the moving eye puppets were really, really, really expensive. And then, while I was doing my searches, I came across one of the moving eye Jerry's. But again, like I said, they're really expensive. And I could not talk my parents into getting me one, not for Christmas, not for a birthday. It was too much of a frivolous expenditure for them. And to this day, I still don't have one. To this day, I still do not have a Moving Eyes Jerry Mahoney. I'm still looking, but until I can find one that's within my grasp, or uh, sorry, within my price range, or with someone I can haggle, or someone I can trade a puppet to, or stuff to, to get one. I'm just gonna have to stick with that super deluxe upgraded J uh, Slappy puppet that I have. You know, the, the one from the beginning of the video. Anyways, thank you all so much for coming back and watching my content. I do truly and greatly appreciate it. If you like what you've seen, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe. Feel free to share this with your friends if they like this kind of thing. And with all that being said, ladies and gentlemen, Cowabunga, and I will see you all in the next video. Peace.